Welcome to the Fat Emperor Podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. Hello all. Today's podcast will focus on data around the current situation the world is facing. So I've been asked a lot about this, a lot of conversations online, as you can imagine, and it's an emerging situation and the data is getting more clear, but certainly no one has a monopoly on the truth or exactly what's happening here. But today I thought I'd take a, a data focused look and share some of the data that's emerged and what it might mean. So in any technical problem or complex issue where there's a lag time between the initial insult and the outcomes and there's a lot of confusion and tension, you know, you really need to look at who are the most at risk. Uh, or what parts are the most at risk? You know, Pareto principle in the extreme, if you will. Where do you focus your effort most? You need to understand this. So who are the most at risk? And first I'll show some Portugal data. And you can see here that there is a mortality spike. This is a severe uh, infection for sure. And there's a mortality spike across the whole population, all age groups, and that's clear. But if you look at just under 65 year olds, there is no real mortality spike versus previous years. So it's all the same data. So the lag is kind of accounted for, but it emphasizes who's more at risk over 65. And someone actually pulled the data for over 75 versus under 75. And if you look at the mortality spike for all ages, again, we see it here compared to 2018, and it's certainly jumped up in April as expected. Um, but when you look at under 75, same data, there's no real spike uh, at all, hardly. So it's not that younger people aren't exposed to, to potential risk and, and to tragic outcomes. Uh, of course they are, because we're talking about hundreds of millions of people in the world and a, a very potent infection. Uh, but it's important to see who the most at risk are and, and to be, um, well, data centric on this. So Switzerland is just another example. Here we've got over 65s uh, specifically, and there's obviously a big spike in April as expected. But under 65s, you know, hardly a blip, right? So it emphasizes the point. And Boston data is actually excellent, and uh, I'll just show it here. Uh, the average age is 81. You can see from their nearly 2,000 deaths, a huge bias towards older age groups and below 60 really very low rates but still tragedy is occurring uh, absolutely but but relatively speaking enormously lower uh, rates or impact and just showing a little more of boston they're actually kind of going through their hump now coming out the other side they're reporting and it's a good point to look at the demographics of who's most impacted because they're kind of coming through and Again, the graph I just showed, enormous age bias and also underlying conditions, 97.5% uh, of the tragic deaths so far had one or, or multiple actually underlying conditions. So if you put together the age and the conditions data, it really, really powerfully focuses us on who we need to most protect in, in this challenge. Second big question is how fast does this spread or indeed what's the prevalence? How many people have been exposed already? Okay, that's, that's a big question and a lot of controversy around this one. But I'll just show some mainstream media uh, indications on feeding data to us. And again, it's all mainstream. So there's no fringe sources I'm gonna use anywhere in this presentation. It's all mainstream data, so be reassured. So we see that there was a Telegraph article around a week ago that in Italy, which was hard hit, they went into nine regions and they did antibody testing and 38% was what was reported for people who had in some way become infected. Many would have been asymptomatic, of course. So that's one figure from Telegraph. We have 15% from uh, German studies in a town that was hit pretty, pretty hard. And again, pretty big figures, 15%. And for these antibody tests, there's some emerging data that people who are least affected, most asymptomatic, who batted off the infection most easily, they may not register enough antibodies produced to, to even uh, come through on the test. So that's something we'll need to see more on in the coming weeks as the tests are developed more. 
Uh, we see random women, and this is not antibody testing, this is inserting a swab and looking for live virus. So in, in New York, random women giving birth, 16% actually had active virus, never mind antibodies. And most of those were asymptomatic, only they, they screened them all. So that, that's a high rate too. Uh, there were sewage studies, but I'm not sure how reliable they are. But again, they showed vastly higher infection rates than were being assumed. 30% uh, came out of Chicago, city wire from phlebotomy or blood donors. You know, seems very high, but that was reported. And we have 31% in Chelsea and Boston. And that's a random sample pulling from people out shopping or on the street. You could say it's a bit biased. Maybe people staying at home and not going out have a lower rate, but you know, maybe not. So again, 30 plus percent is huge. The Guardian as well reported on homes. So we look a little bit at within institutions, ships, homes, how prevalent did it get? And here we've got over 25% in San Francisco in one of the care homes. Ireland has a massive problem with care homes, right? Huge spreads. And two thirds of our debts last week were from care homes and institutions of our overall debts for the whole country. And I think it's still running well over a half. We've got the uh, homeless shelter in Boston, 36% when they went in and checked, you know, mostly asymptomatic, but they're big percentages. And the ships are interesting. French aircraft carrier here, they reckon it went into port, someone got it on land or maybe a few people. And um, within a couple of weeks, she had 38% of the sailors had it. So these are enclosed spaces, sure, but it just shows you how transmissible this is. And it has been running two months in Europe and America, at least since the first verified cases, with no controls whatsoever. So one would wonder what the prevalence really is when we get the right testing. And uh, here's another ship. This was the USS Theodore Roosevelt. I think there was over 600 out of 4,800. Uh, would have got it and that would have been over a short time frame and 73 percent is the highest i've seen yet one ohio prison so we don't know the outcomes for those people yet there's very little uh, impact so far but we need a couple of weeks to see what really happens but two and a half thousand people approximately 73 percent got it over probably a relatively short period so that gives a flavor the latest is from cuomo in new york the governor and he's talking about around 15% when they did extensive kind of semi-randomized testing across the county. And they're guessing at the infection fatality rates at 0.5%, but they may be low because they're not counting all of the uh, tragic deaths. Um, but, you know, these figures will firm up over time. It's probably important to note as well that for that 0.5% or whatever it turns out to be, it's enormously stacked towards uh, underlying health issues and um, advanced age, as you might expect. But still, of course, there are younger people, uh, less unhealthy people where tragedies are occurring. And that's a reality. But again, keeping an eye on the overall picture. Uh, Boston, I'll remind again, because they have the best data, you know, on the age and of course on the underlying conditions, you know. So just, just to always keep that in mind as to what the big picture is on overall impact. The optimal strategy, flattening the curve. Everyone knows about that. What is the optimal strategy? And the question here is not total lockdown versus nothing. So some people are being very, I think, devious out there in the internet and trying to say, we need a lockdown you're suggesting or someone is suggesting we do nothing right Th that's never true so the compare here is total lockdown efficacy or value or impact on helping versus smart distancing masks uh, surfaces hands protecting the most at risk which we talked about very carefully invest in resources in ring fencing and really protecting them because they're the ones at risk that's where the vast majority of the deaths are coming from so it's looking at lockdown versus smart distancing is the compare and the relative difference between them long term so just to be very clear on the definition of what we're talking about here. So Sweden comes up, obviously, because they've decided not to do a lockdown, but to do 
a kind of not a really hard version of smart distancing. So they don't even have masks. But what they're doing basically is trying to protect the elderly, but they admit they messed up on that and they didn't manage to because most of their deaths are in care homes and they didn't really ring fence them. So they admit that. Uh, but they're allowing it in the healthier population to spread at a moderate rate. And they're hoping that it will behave like many other diseases and they'll keep the hospitals not overwhelmed, which they've managed to do so far because they have more than 20% of capacity remaining and apparently they're over the hump in terms of ICU admittance. So they've kind of achieved that one. But the question is, will it be the best policy long term? And we need to wait for the data. But we look at a little data here on this controversial strategy. So I will say up front, I'm going to compare with Denmark in the graphs. And the reason is because I think it's a good compare. Denmark has 5 million people. They got a land bridge to Sweden, a huge amount of traffic before any lockdown happened. And Sweden has 10 million, but it's concentrated down here right beside Denmark. So I think it's a very good and fair compare uh, for these purposes. Things are lower in Finland, which is very isolated and sparse, and certainly lower in Norway also. But again, I don't think they're as good compares if you're trying to read into an ambiguous situation. So just a bit on the geographics dynamics there um, and demographics. So let's go ahead and see. So Denmark's certainly much lower than Sweden in the rolled up uh, deaths per million people. Uh, Ireland's in there in the middle. Netherlands is worse. United Kingdom seems to be worse. Just a smattering of countries. But certainly Sweden is considerably higher than Denmark, which you could say is a result of their strategy. Though they have also said that they have very large occupancy care homes in Sweden and they got hit really hard. So because most of the deaths come from care homes, from an engineering perspective, it wouldn't take you long to have double as much uh, overall fatalities if you got much more hit in care homes, you know. So we don't know what the, all the figures are, but we we need to watch the situation and, and see how it develops really and just looking at the uh, kind of just the simple line plot of deaths per day you can see it's kind of a bit chaotic there for for most countries but denmark lower again in fairness uh, turning the or bending the curve this is log scale and looking at how countries are kind of getting over the hump and yeah sweden's noisy it's it's in the middle. It's certainly worse than Denmark, but it seems to be turning. Uh, they're also stating that their de data is actually lagged. So they feel that they are coming around the corner now. And you could argue that they they should be higher in the short term because they've taken a strategy of facing the home head on and then later they will have less. So over time it will average out, but they'll have kept things on a, a steady keel. Um, so we, we'll, we'll see over time, but it's not as clear cut as some people are making it out to be at this point. So I just saw this article 10 minutes before I recorded this, so I threw it in there. You can freeze frame and read it. But yeah, they are maintaining right up to today that they're correct. Who knows? But they're certainly being bullish about it. But we shall see. We shall see. So another note really on impact of lockdown versus smart distancing. This is from the Koch Institute. It was sent to me uh, advising the German government. And the R0 is kind of the reproductive uh, number for a, a disease, how fast it will spread. And this is modeled R0s from existing data. And what it shows is that Germany here kind of tightened things up. And then here in the dashed line is their lockdown. But what it appears is that the R0 was falling rapidly down to 1 before any major measures happened. And after that, it hasn't changed much. So again, there's this and more data from other countries and specialists suggesting that the lockdown may not be giving much extra bang for the buck over what smart distancing did. Um, but there's obviously a big difference in impact to the world and, and to economies and everything else. So we need to know we're getting a big bang for the buck, I guess, is probably the thing. And a university professor, Oxford University, you know, no fringe here, a professor who's an expert in this whole area is coming out the last few days and saying kind of what I indicated, that the lockdowns, looking at the data dynamics from the past few weeks, that the curve was turning before the lockdowns could realistically kick in. 
So again, it's a similar point. We, we need to look closely as the data emerges and see how much extra lockdowns, keeping people in out of parks, out of younger, healthier people, how much is it giving us? You know, it's going to give something. The question is how much more it gives than smart distancing and smart measures. Uh, Oxford University, I won't read this out, but they've come out with an update 9th of April. So you can freeze frame and read that there. They make projections based on existing actual data and there's some positive news in there potentially. Um, but they're certainly kind of seem to be very rock steady, data centric, calm, collected compared to some of the coverage. So worth looking at that. And Irish Corona news, I'm going to finish with an Irish flavor and kind of a philosophical thing, really. A few pieces of news came out yesterday and they don't seem to add up to each other. Right. There's an inconsistency. So I'll show the first one and it's the same or similar to all the previous daily updates from the Irish government on the deaths and the demographics, basic data. So 44 new deaths yesterday. The median age was 87. It's generally always over 80 and 33 people had underlying health conditions. And that's similar each day as well. Not to say that younger or apparently more healthy people are not affected. Of course they are in fairness, but it's just to show the pattern. But also in the news yesterday came out that nursing home staff are being told don't wear even face masks unless there's a virus outbreak, in which case it's way too late, right? Way too late. So that seems incongruent with this, right? The Pareto principle, data centricity, most at risk, hmm, unusual. And other news, and there's lots of news like this all over the media in Ireland, uh, there's going to be continued a uh, significant curtailment of activity for all of the healthy people and younger people, you know, as this goes on, uh, which again, there's a certain incongruence there, if you will, but I leave it to you to decide. So I might do another of these as more data merges in the next week. Uh, it's certainly a dynamic situation. And again, staying data centric and staying with mainstream sources of information and no fringe. So apologies to many people who've copied me on tweets, which have stuff that's a little more questionable in terms of source. And they'll see there's no likes and no retweets, but uh, that's the way you got to be in these times. So you got to stick with the, the most dependable data. And if I could just ask again to support the free podcast, we uh, have done a lot in the last year to bring, I think, 70 episodes and a lot more material and talks all for free. But if you go to extratimemovie.com, see our fascinating movie about heart disease reversal, and it's $3.99 to stream and $9.99 to uh, download and own. And going there and sharing that site and spreading the information and enjoying the movie uh, would really help us. So thanks a lot, guys. Till next time. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen. And go to extratimemovie.com to see our fascinating new documentary on stopping and reversing heart disease.